Obama and 2000 presidential candidate Alan Keyes. This is just under an hour. Welcome. We are joined now by Chicago high school students who will get to discuss the issues that are important to them with Republican Alan Keyes and Democrat Barack Obama. The candidates, of course, are running for Illinois' open U.S. Senate seat. The students are part of Student Voices. That's a national civic education project funded by the Annenberg Foundation. It's run locally by the Mikva Challenge, a nonprofit group that gets Chicago high school students involved in the political process. And you should know that this program was taped on Wednesday. We begin now with Republican candidate for U.S. Senate, Alan Keyes. He won our coin toss. His opponent, Democrat Barack Obama, will join the students later in the hour. Now to our first question from Mr. Keyes, and it comes from Pythian Woods. Pythian, where are you? Hold on. Mr. Keyes, you have expressed the fact that you strongly believe in the Second Amendment right to bear arms, but how can you reconcile this with the fact that 599 people were murdered in Chicago in 2003? Well, I think the simple answer is that 599 people weren't murdered by guns, they were murdered by people. Uh, and that means that the real source of crime and violence in our society is not a thing. And we can't pretend that it is. Uh, the truth of the matter is that crime and violence originate in the choices that people make, in the character or lack of character they have, in the respect they have for other human beings and for the laws and rules that ought to govern our society. We are a free people. And one of the things that's essential to freedom is the ability to defend yourself and your liberties. If we are no longer capable of handling the means of our defense, then we'll start to live like medieval people lived, who had to rely on a military class to defend them. But you know what happens then, don't you? That military class becomes your rulers. Free people started to make their progress toward real self-government when they stopped being afraid of the means of self-defense and stood on battlefields to defend their liberty. I think if, we have some follow-up questions. Uh, you had your hand up. How would you feel if your own family member were put, almost like someone were to put them at gunpoint, how would you feel saying that you believe in um, guns and having them there? People have other means of defending themselves. Speech is a freedom that we have that we can be able to stop ourselves from using guns. It doesn't always have to resort to guns and you're trying to say that everything has to resort to guns in defending ourselves, which isn't true. Well, actually, I, I didn't say that. But the question but is, if your own you family are, member were assaulted with a gun. When you are confronted, what I'd want if my family member, a uh, matter of fact, that happened here in Illinois. Uh, somebody burglarized somebody's house and they then ran off with stuff, came back a second time. And there were, I think, a 10 and 12 year old child were in the home. And I'll bet that homeowner was real glad that he had a weapon with which to defend his sleeping children. You're talking you about know the, the case problem? Movement. The problem with defending yourself against those who are armed when you're using words is that they end up killing and you end up dead. Uh, and it would be as if we were to defend ourselves against terrorism in the world today with words. We want to use words, but against people who intend violence against us, our families, our country, Sometimes words will not suffice, and we must remain a people capable of defending ourselves, or we will not remain free. One more follow-up on this issue. Yes, are you saying that violence is justified by violence? No, I'm saying that sometimes in the face of elements, particularly criminal elements and others who are wicked, if you're not capable of defending the, yourself, then they will kill or enslave you. Uh, and I think that's a, simply a lesson of human history. Free societies can remain free in the face of those who intend to do them harm only if they retain the capacity to defend themselves. Now, that doesn't mean violence. That means the proper use of the means of self-defense in those circumstances where it's necessary. Uh, and in our society, that includes an ability on our part uh, under approaches that would properly educate us in the understanding and use of, of, of arms uh, to do that in our own defense. But remember, the key to the difference between the criminal use and the legitimate use of such weapons lies in the heart, lies in the education. That is what you do with words. You prepare the heart of people properly to approach, properly to understand the attitude they should take toward others. All right, one more follow-up on this question since there's so much interest. Um, I've been a victim of street violence. I was shot. How do you expect me or other people who have been victims of this to feel any safer with more guns available to the people. See, but I, I think, unhappily, it is not the gun that shot you. Somebody has gotten us to focus on a falsehood. Okay? The problem in our communities is not with weapons, it is with people. And unless we change the people, by the way, anything can be used as a weapon. Do you realize that in Rwanda, 
A million and a half people were slaughtered. What were they mostly killed by? Machetes, not guns. Huge, massive death, which resulted not from what thing you used, but from what was going on in the hearts and minds of the people. Well, how about that? Do you feel you were shot by a gun or by a person? Well, I feel I was shot by a person because the, I, was feel, I was shot by a person, but the person had the gun, which if you're giving out people, I feel that you're letting people, giving, not literally giving the guns to the people, but you're allowing them to have it, then it's like you're telling them, okay, it's okay if well, you could go let ahead me ask and you a question. Somebody. Let me ask you a question. Uh, do you realize that more people died on our highways last year than died in gun-related violence? Does that mean that we shouldn't let people drive? Certain people are out there, they are killed by knives and other sharp implements in their own homes in domestic violence. Does that mean that as is true on our airplanes now, we should only allow people to buy plastic utensils? We get into a situation where we come to the conclusion that in order to be safe, we must be treated like children who cannot make responsible decisions, who cannot live together in a responsible way in the presence of anything that's going to be dangerous or harmful. And that means we would no longer be free. There used to be a word, despotism, that described a society where people were not free. Despotes was the Greek word for head of household, and it meant that everyone in the, in the country would be treated as if they are children. Do you think that would be suitable for a free society? Because I, I think we have to find another way. Okay, this is the very last question, and this time I mean it. <laughs> Um, I think that we had enough guns on our streets before they became legal to allow the legal influctuation of guns in such a mass way. Do you not feel that you are giving more people who have less stability mentally? You're giving more, you say people kill, not guns. You're allowing these people to get the means to kill, which otherwise without this influctuation, they wouldn't have. And I don't think it's very hard to get a gun on you've, the streets of Chicago, regardless of whether actually, it's legal or not. You've actually identified the real source of the problem. See? Uh, and the real source of the problem lies, as you just said, in the people, not in the guns. The question then arises, what do you do about the people? Uh, and at the end of the day, the answer to that question lies in education. The answer to that question lies in morality. The answer to that question lies in shaping heart, mind, and conscience in such a way that one understands the proper and appropriate context in which those things which are intended to defend rights, to defend freedom, to defend the innocent against assault would properly be used uh, rather than using them uh, in criminal enterprises. So you go after the heart to shape the minds of law-abiding citizens. You allow law-abiding citizens access to the means wherewith to defend home and family, and then you apply penalties that should be, I think, fairly strict and harsh to people who abuse their rights in order to harm others. But don't you realize that would be true of every right we have in society? There's not a single right we enjoy that cannot be abused to the harm of others. Shall we take them away from everyone in order to make us safe? No, that would mean an end to freedom. So what we do is we distinguish between the people who use their rights properly and we give them full amplitude in those rights and against those who abuse them in order to harm others in society, we have laws and penalties in order to make it clear that we will not tolerate their actions. But if we go down the road of confiscation that says we're going to take from you every right that can be abused by people, we'll end up with no rights at all. We'll live in a police state. And I don't think that's where we should be. All right, let's move on. And uh, I think we have a question from Veronica. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to know, what's your position on um, reparations for descendants of slaves? You know, I think this is something that has been addressed by America ever since slavery itself. Uh, and I am against the idea that you extort money from people in order to pay for injustice. The injustice of slavery was paid for during the Civil War in blood and treasure. Uh, and I think it's wrong to suggest that money can accomplish that purpose. America did that by confronting the evil and paying the price that was necessary to end it. But there was real damage done to people by, this, by slavery, and that damage was passed from one generation to the next. It was recognized that it was being done. Uh, they had a program, 40 Acres and a Mule, that was supposed to help people to overcome. It ended, by the way, in, in failure, in a context in which segregation and Jim Crow were reintroduced at the end of Reconstruction. A new assault took place against the very same people who had been enslaved and their descendants. 
This passed a legacy of damage from one generation to the next. They tried to deal with it with the Great Society programs and all of that. Again, it failed. How would you deal with it? So I would argue you keep working at what is needed to be done until it's done, right? It hasn't been done yet. We need to repair the damage. And the way I've suggested that we do it is a way that was used in the old Roman Empire. When a people had been damaged, either due to the action or neglect of government, they relieved that people of the burden of taxation uh, in order that, to give them time to heal themselves. And that would mean for, for the in, uh, descendants of slaves in America, there would be a period of time, maybe a generation, during which they wouldn't have to bear the burden of supporting the public wheel, but instead could devote and control all their resources to developing their wealth base, healing their families, starting banks if they were wealthier people that would, would lend money into the community. It would also mean that the labor pool of people presently unemployed would become attractive to employers because the employer would look at that labor pool and say, if I lo locate my business over here, I'll get access to labor without that added cost of what I would ordinarily have to pay the government. And that means the unemployment problem, the people who don't now have jobs, would find that they would become attractive to train up and be, be employed. So a lot of the goals we tried to achieve with expensive bureaucratic programs that didn't work would be achieved by giving all kinds of people the incentive. Finally, if I own a business and I don't have to pay federal, federal taxes, what does that do to my profit margin? That means that my business becomes more attractive to investment. So everything we've tried to accomplish, get more employment, get more investment, do things that would allow families to have greater access to income and savings for their future, it could all be accomplished in this way without taking a cent out of anybody else's pocket. And Muriel has a question. Um, what do you think of the Chicago proposal that would change the penalty for marijuana possession from jail to fines? I think we have to be careful because uh, I believe that encouraging the culture of drug use is actually incompatible with the kind of citizens we need to be as free people. I worry when I see people going down a road where they're going to enslave themselves to chemicals. Uh, or any other addiction, because it's incompatible. We're supposed to be free people. Free people are people who are able to make their choices with their own will, not with a will that is being manipulated by people who can give or withhold some source of pleasure or intoxication. This is a very dangerous road to go down, and I wouldn't want to encourage it. On the other hand, I think it has been outrageous that users have been subject sometimes under our system to big penalties, long years in jail, and so forth, when they are not the real source, necessarily, of the immediate problem. So I would be tough on dealers, tough on people who are selling and violating the law by doing so. Uh, but I would be willing to look at the possibility that appropriate fines should be levied against uh, individuals who make use rather than jail time. But I would also want to leave the option of some jail time for, for those people who, for instance, might not be in a position to pay the fine but would still owe a penalty. Brandy has a question. Brandy, where are you? Seeing that you have not been here for long, you say that you're committed to the problems here. If you do not win this race, will you continue to stay in Illinois or will you return to Maryland? Well, I think I'm forming attachments and, and developing the kind of friendships and relationships with a large number of people. I had them already in Illinois. That's part of why I was invited in. Uh, and I think that the commitment one makes in a situation like this, I've already pulled up stakes and left what was my home. Uh, the emotional difficulty of confronting that was part of the decision to come here. And that decision has already been taken. I'm here, and I am committed to the people of Illinois. Does that mean you'll stay here if you lose? I think that's what I said. I'm here, and I'm committed to the people of Illinois. So you'll be living but in Calumet City. The, the great problem is that, you know, I just violated one of my most important rules, and I only did it because you're you. If you had been a reporter, you know what I would have said? I don't even consider for one second the possibility that I will lose this election. It's not on my mind. Uh, but I gave you a... Uh, more complete answer. Uh, I, as a reporter, I have to follow up with the question in light of the poll showing that you're behind by more than 50 points. You still take that position? Well, the serious problem is that all those polls are sourced in places that have deep hostility to my campaign. There's nothing objective about these polls. I studied. I'm a political scientist. I know how they're put together. They can be so easily manipulated that I have already said all polls should be banned. Their publication should be banned within 45 days of all elections. Uh, it actually violates the premise of the secret ballot. Do you know why we have a secret ballot? 
so that we can't, we can't look around and see where the majority is going when we make our decision, so that that pressure won't be on individuals to go with the flow, but instead they'll make independent judgments about what's best for their community. Polling actually allows the people who control the polls to herd people in a certain direction, thereby depriving the people of their true and independent choice. And I think that that destroys the integrity of our elections. We've got to move on to Carneal. You have a question. Hi, uh, Mr. Keyes. In 1992, you gave an interview to the Washington Post denouncing the GOP party as racist, thus the reason that they would not support your campaign. Um, do you still believe that the Republican Party is racist? And if so, um, how do you plan to access the Republican minority voters and also the swing voters? Actually, as I have said often, said in the aftermath of that interview, that's not exactly what I said. I mean, I think the media always gives the most sensationalized version of everything. Uh, and in point of fact, I pointed to the influence of, of uh, racism and its possibility and the fact that the Republican Party was not then taking seriously the need effectively to reach out to the black community. Uh, and I think that to a certain extent, that is still true today. Uh, for that reason, I established an organization, Black America's Political Action Committee, which independently of the party, seeks out, works with, supports people, who are entering the political arena in the black community, helps them where other people won't. Because the first time you step into the political arena, when people think you don't have a chance, that's when you most need the help. That's when you most need the encouragement. That's the time when people are preparing and training for what will later become more effective political roles. And I have been working hard to try to build an independent basis for making sure that as a conservative and a Republican, people who can uh, represent those views will be pushed forward and moved forward into positions of political participation and leadership. Uh, and as part of the Republican Party, uh, in that sense, I think I'm working to try to remedy what I still think is a problem. But you know why it's a problem? Let's be clear. We're in a situation now, and have been for quite some time, where the Democrat Party takes the black vote for granted. We're going to get it, 90, 95 percent. And many Republicans write the black vote off. Why bother with it? Black people aren't going to vote for us anyway. My problem with that, y'all, is that that utterly eliminates the political bargaining power of the black community. People bargain with you when they're not certain about what you will do. They come to you in order to make proposals when they think that some modification in that proposal, a little up, a little down, might get your allegiance. If they think that you can't be influenced and you just keep swinging in one direction, what eventually happens, and it has happened to the black community, is that you lose your political clout. A few individuals can still benefit in areas that are predominantly black, but the community as a whole has suffered and still suffers from the fact that there's no bargaining power. People bargain with you when they can't take you for granted, when they can't be sure of what you'll do. Once they are, they either take you for granted or give up on you. And in politics for the black community, that doesn't serve the best interests of the people, but that's what has happened. Hands keep shooting up, and I wish we could go to more follow-ups, but there's so many topics we want to get to. Sylvia, you're next. Um, my school only has 15% of the student population reading at grade level. How would you fix my school, or, or what do you propose to solve this issue? Well, I like the latter formulation better, because uh, I don't think government can fix the schools. I'll be honest with you. Uh, I think that a big part of our problem right now is that we moved away from what had been a an effective paradigm for education toward a government-dominated approach that actually cut us off from what had been the most effective approach to education in American history. And I cite not only the example of frontiers and other things, but you realize even in the black community, between the time that black folks were freed from slavery until 1910, 1915, there was actually a tremendous increase in literacy in the black community, the ability to read, to write, to have other skills, and that was during a time when Jim Crow segregation was actually cutting people off from proper resources in terms of government support for education. How did people do it? They did it through the community, through church-based approaches and things that were based on what families working together insisted on in the way of quality and results for their kids. My solution, therefore, let's, let's give them the power to do it again. Let's say that the money we spend on education will follow the choice of parents not the choice of educrats, bureaucrats, politicians, that children could then go to schools their parents choose, or better yet, that if you have a community, say a church community, where you've got sometimes thousands of people, hundreds of families, you would be able to take all those children, 
Their presence would constitute a budget with which you could start a school that responded to your needs, that was under your control, and that would be subject to that intimate relationship that's needed between home and school in order for all of this to work. I think that that partnership between the school and the home based on empowered parents is the key to getting really effective improvement. Not just going down a road that gives the bureaucrats a chance to impose their standards while imposing penalties, and in a sense, not addressing the real core of what makes for effective education. Because motivation and results are hand in hand, and you don't get those two things unless the home is respected, and unless school and home work together like that. But for that to happen, parents have to meet their responsibilities, and the schools have to respect the role of the parents. And I think that has been broken down in our society. And we've got to move on to the next topic. And the next question comes from Robin. Mr. Keyes, you stated that you oppose gay marriages, but what if a family member told you that they were a, a homosexual and they said they wanted to get married? Would you support them? Please explain why or why not. Oh, I, I couldn't. And, and the reason is very simple. Uh, you're asking me a personal question, right, in, in terms of what I'd say to a family member. And that has to be governed, doesn't it, by my personal conscience? Mm -hmm. And my personal conscience is shaped by my faith. And my faith is very clear that homosexual relationships are sinful and wrong. And I will not, not facilitate my children, whom I love, in going down a path that, according to my faith, leads to a kind of death that's worse than physical death. Uh, and as a result, of course I'm not going to do that. You don't love somebody if you become the facilitator of the destruction of their spiritual and moral life. And so from a personal point of view, I would have to take the stand that this is a, a relationship that leads to a place that is destructive of moral and spiritual existence. And I would not approve, I would not facilitate, I would not support, because God would not forgive me for abandoning truth where my child is concerned. We think we love people when we lead them down roads like this. No, we don't. We hate them. You hate somebody when you're willing to allow them to risk their immortal souls and spiritual life for the sake of something that at the end of the day, in your belief and faith, you objectively know to be wrong. And, and so, of course, if you're asking me a personal question, I'll be guided by my faith and my God. And I will answer that question according to that Christian truth which must guide my judgment and has always when it comes to my children. A follow-up from a student. You say that you are religious or whatever. Why don't you believe that people should make their own decisions if they want to be gay? Well, meaning offense, I, 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 he didn't ask me whether I would interfere, stop, or somehow. I can't do that. Adult people will make their judgments. He asked whether I'd facilitate, help, support. The answer to that question is no. It would be as if someone came and said, I want to kill myself. Will you help me? According to my personal conscience and belief, the answer to that question is absolutely not. That is a violation of the laws of God. I would be a murderer. I can't facilitate my children in going down a path that leads to their destruction. If you ask me to do that, you are saying you violate your faith, violate your conscience, disobey what you objectively believe to be the will of God, and set your children on a road that you deeply believe will lead to their destruction and not their physical destruction, to their destruction in the eternal sense that they will be cut off from that salvation which God has offered to them. Uh, and that would be to betray my God, and that does not lead, that's not an act of love. Uh, my job with respect to my children is to try to example to them and help them to establish the relationship with God, not to go down a path that would destroy it. I'm very religious myself. I'm seven events. We believe that we, don't, we, we, don't, we do not accept it, but we're not saying that we're going to dislike that person because of that. That's, for instance, saying, like, your daughter got pregnant. You wouldn't ban her. You want to put her away. You have to support her and whatnot, well, things like that. Thing is, what, but what? it's like you can't, if you're such a Christian, you're supposed to forgive and forget, and you're supposed to love that person no matter what they do. It's Actually, their choice. But Actually, two things. Uh, first part of that statement, I don't know where it came from. I was asked whether I would facilitate, support, do this and that with gay marriage. I said no. I was not asked whether I would like my, my, my child, whether I would love my child, whether I would do that. That's not implied. All I pointed out, though, was when you facilitate someone in a path that you believe to be destructive in the most fundamental sense possible, that facilitation is not love. It is hatred. And I will not act in a way of hatred toward my children whom I love. Second point, uh, in, in terms of 
of uh, you know, other uh, aspects and elements uh, of this. I think we have to stand for truth with our children. Uh, and the most important and loving thing that I can do is share that gospel of truth. And the notion, for instance, that uh, the phrase I think you used was forgive and forget. Well, actually, from a Christian point of view, as I said, that's, that's not what, what Jesus represented. He didn't say forgive and forget. He said, if he repents, excuse me, everybody forgets the first part of this. He says, if your friend comes to you, if he repent, forgive him. If he repent, forgive him. When he spoke to the adulteress, he didn't forgive and forget. He looked at her and said, go and sin no more. What he said to her basically was, repent, turn away from your sin. We want to act as if, from a Christian point of view, aiding and abetting people as they wallow in sinfulness is love. That is not love. It Mr. is not truth. Mr. Keyes and Christ did not example that. What he exampled was, speak the truth and encourage that walk which will lead people to turn away from their sin. And in consequence of that repentance, forgive them. We want to preach the forgiveness and forget the repentance, and that's not love. Mr. Keyes, is this an issue you've had to face in your own family? Uh, well, I'll answer that question in the appropriate context. I don't think this is it. This is not an appropriate context in a group of young people? It's, it's not, no. And yet there are many families throughout Illinois. So I will say this to that. I think everybody in America, given the enormous pressures of our present culture, has had to face the issue of how you deal with all the sexual temptations that your children are subject to. It runs the gamut. Uh, and the notion that you're helping out your child, loving your child, when you give them the impression that behaviors that are both delusional and self-destructive, and that lead away from the kind of life that can provide a stable foundation for happiness and real fulfillment, that you're loving somebody when you help them go down that road, I reject this notion of love. Sometimes you have to speak the truth in love. And if the truth is difficult, you still speak it out of that love which believes that the truth shall make you free, not lies. The truth shall make you free. Not a willingness to paper over the truth about how God stands with respect to certain kinds of sinful behavior. We need that standard of God's will. And I think as a parent, I have to try to articulate it. I have to try to respect it. Sure, there, I am going to give the real impression. We're just human beings. We're going to make mistakes. We're all of us going to stumble and fall. But that doesn't change the standard, and we need to be clear and honest about what that standard is. And I'm afraid that is all the time we have. I'd like to thank all of you for being uh, part of this program. Our thanks to Alan Keyes, and let's give Mr. Keyes a round of applause today. And we will be right back with his opponent, Barack Obama, when our Student Voices Forum continues. This Chicago Tonight election special was made possible in part by a grant from the Annenberg Foundation. And welcome back, and we're now joined by Barack Obama, the Democratic candidate for Illinois' open U.S. Senate seat. And a reminder, this program was taped midweek. Now to our first question for Mr. Obama, and I believe it comes from you. Yes. Hi, um, Senator Obama, name one quality about yourself that will convince us, the Illinois citizens, to vote for you as a U.S. Senator. You know, I think the, the one quality that uh, I'm very proud of is the quality of empathy. Uh, you know, I think that because I come from a diverse background, uh, have had a diverse set of experiences, uh, I think that uh, I can stand in somebody else's shoes uh, and imagine what it's like for a single mother who's struggling to raise their children or can imagine uh, somebody downstate who uh, doesn't have a job, just had the plant closed and are trying to figure out uh, how to retrain for uh, the jobs of the future uh, but don't have any, uh, d uh, doesn't have the money for it. Uh, and, and I think that uh, ability to uh, extend beyond yourself and, and think about other people from other people's perspectives is especially important because the country is becoming more diverse and the world is shrinking. Uh, and hopefully I can use that skill to bring people together around uh, uh, the solutions that we need for uh, the problems that we face. Our second question comes from Veronica Peralta. Where is she, Veronica? 
Senator Obama, do you support reparations for descendants of slaves? You know, I, I am not in favor of uh, monetary reparations, uh, not because I'm not mindful of the tragedy that slavery was in this country. It's, it's really the stain across our entire history. Um, and we still pay for the legacy of slavery in all sorts of ways. Uh, I mean, part of the reason that uh, African Americans uh, on every indicator uh, continue to lag behind has to do with the enormous challenges and difficulties over the centuries in this country, uh, not only from slavery, but also from Jim Crow. Uh, but I also think that uh, the best way for us to solve the problems that not only African Americans face, but young Latinos face, and and other groups that uh, are uh, disproportionately poor or disadvantaged uh, is to create programs that uh, benefit everybody uh, because there are a lot of poor whites out there as well and there are a lot of uh, poor uh, uh, and, and disadvantaged youth from all uh, ethnic groups and I think that we should have a commitment to all of them. And I think we have a question that's related to your answer from James Williams. James. Chicago is one of the most segregated cities in the nation. You can hardly find a city or a neighborhood that's not um, all black, all white, or all Latino. Why do you think that's so? Well, you know, some of it has to do with this past that we were just talking about. Uh, you know, uh, segregation was never legal, uh, formally on the books in Illinois and in uh, a city like Chicago, but uh, de facto, as a practical matter, it was encouraged. Housing patterns were uh, created that uh, didn't allow African Americans to live in certain neighborhoods. Uh, and I think that over time that got reinforced by uh, policies not only from city government but also the federal government. Uh, it, it's one of the biggest and most difficult challenges that we face. Uh, but one encouraging sign I think is, is that you see less segregation among uh, those individuals who have similar economic strata. If they're doing well, uh, if they're well educated, uh, if they have job opportunities, uh, then what you start seeing is their ability to move and live where they want. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important for us to make sure that every ethnic group in this city and every ethnic group in this state uh, have high quality education, are able to finance their college educations, and then uh, are able to access the jobs that will allow them to make choices in terms of uh, in terms of housing availability. We have a question regarding education. It comes from Narin Yokana. Narin, excuse me. How do you plan to deal with the school funding inequities? For example, Evanston High School offers so much more than my school. Than my school. Right. This is something that's been a problem, uh, not only in Illinois, but in almost every state, because we rely too much on property taxes uh, to finance our uh, public schools and some uh, uh, some areas have much higher property tax values uh, than other areas and so as a consequence it creates these inequalities now most of those problems have to be dealt with at the state level but there are a couple things that the federal government can do and, and as a consequence a couple of things that a US senator can do to deal with this issue um, the most important thing that the federal government can do is fulfill its commitments uh, to the states to provide the funding that it has promised uh, in the past. So, for example, special education uh, is something that ensures that disabled children uh, get the same uh, opportunities for education as all children do. And that makes sense. We, we should want to give opportunities to persons with disabilities. But the federal government, when it passed this law, said that it would provide 40 percent of the funding for special education. Uh, it's never come close to that. It's only provided typically 15, 17 percent. And what that means is that local school districts have to make up the shortfall. So the federal government has not fulfilled its duties to uh, the schools at the state level, has not reimbursed the state for education funding, and that makes it harder then for us to change the formula to lift schools up so that every school has a baseline of support that it needs. And my job, I think, as a U.S. Senator is to make sure that the United States government fulfills its promise in terms of the money uh, that's supposed to be coming into Illinois. Mr. Obama, follow-up questions along, along those lines. Uh, given the state that the, uh, the federal economy is in right now, in terms of the budget and spending on Iraq and right. so forth, 
is that really realistic that the federal government is going to be supporting schools more than it already is? Well, I think the, uh, we have to make choices, and there are a whole host of choices that we can make. Look, the, uh, even in the enormous budget uh, deficits that have been created by George Bush uh, over the last three years, uh, we're still seeing spending on uh, certain uh, military procurements that are unnecessary. We're still seeing earmarks uh, on appropriation bills that are building, for example, a, a $50 million uh, jungle uh, uh, dome uh, in Iowa because uh, the, 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 the uh, individual who, who passed this bill happens to uh, uh, sit on the, uh, happens to chair the Appropriations Committee. I mean, there's still a lot of money that we're spending in ways that if you took a poll not just of these students, but uh, the average American citizen, they'd say, why are we spending money on this? On the other hand, spending money on schools is something that I think all of us uh, believes makes sense. And we have a question uh, from this side of the aisle. I believe it has to do with uh, specifically a youth issue. Mm, uh, Mr. Obama, did you yourself struggle with um, the issues that many Illinois youth face as far as drugs, gangs, violence, and school attendance? Mm -hmm. Well, the, uh, I, I certainly did. I mean, you know, I was somebody who uh, didn't know my father very well, uh, who wasn't uh, in the house most of my youth. Uh, when I was a teenager, um, I've already stated that I had uh, experimented with drugs. I rejected school in a lot of ways. I focused mostly on sports and, uh, and having fun. Uh, and although I was not under the same pressure as I think that a lot of young people growing up in a place like Chicago are because we didn't have guns on the streets. Uh, we'd get in fights, but they were fist fights, right? You didn't have somebody uh, you know, uh, pulling, out a, pulling out a nine millimeter uh, just because you got into an argument. So the pressures that young people feel now, uh, I think, are much more intense than anything that I had to go through. But I do know that uh, the uh, confusion and the lack of role models and uh, the sense sometimes that uh, nobody's listening to you or that you don't have a stake in the society. Uh, I think those are things that I experienced uh, partly as an African American, uh, but partly I think it's what a lot of young people go through generally. Uh, and, and one of the ways that I got out of that, uh, got out of that bad place and started uh, taking my schoolwork seriously and started, um, uh, you know, not uh, drinking and, 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 and doing drugs was uh, to refocus my attention on not just myself but the community around me and start to ask questions about well why uh, is uh, uh, wh why is it that some people have so much opportunity and some people have so little how can we uh, create a, a fairer society starting to ask questions that took me out of myself and made me more concerned with other people and I think when you do that uh, you end up um, not only uh, being helpful to the community, but you also, I think, uh, uh, end up uh, feeling better about yourself and, and who you are. Any follow-ups to that? Yes. Uh, I have a follow-up question for the education statement that you made earlier. Yeah. Okay, on your website, you state that um, you will help the loans, yeah. help the middle-class people instead of the banks. How would that benefit the lower-class people who need it more? Well, actually, the uh, you know that refers to college education as opposed to public school funding K through 12. And our proposal specifically says that uh, too many of our young people don't have access to college educations. Or if they do, they have to take out a huge amount of loans that burden them. And that makes it more difficult for them to make choices, for example, to go into teaching or to go into professions that don't pay a lot of money, even if they, that's what they want to do. So uh, the main federal program is called the Pell Grant program. And right now, uh, the, the highest Pell Grant you can get is only four, I think it's 4,050. Uh, and what we've proposed is, is that the high, highest amount should be 5,000, uh, I think 5,100. Uh, and we've also said that more people should get these Pell Grants. Now, these Pell Grants are primarily geared not only to middle class, but also to low-income students. Uh, and the way we've said to, we can pay for this is eliminating student loan programs right now that instead of going directly to the student are run through banks and the banks take out their profit before they pass on the loan to you and what we've said is if you just cut out the middleman and you have the federal government directly giving those loans to the students which is about how half of the student loans currently are, are, are financed you would free up about four point five billion dollars that could be used to expand loans 
for all students. So it's not just middle class students. In fact, low income students are the people who benefit the most from these Pell Grant programs. And there was another follow up question. Yes, ma'am. I was wondering, what was your platform for after school activities for inner city schools? Well, you know, I think this is uh, a, a critical component, and it goes to the question earlier about getting into trouble or, uh, you know, not, uh, not always being on the right track when I was young. Uh, every study shows that th the highest incidence of youth violence, delinquency, uh, run-ins with the law happen after school. That, that those hours from 3 to 6 uh, are the, the periods of time when uh, young people uh, are most likely to get into trouble. So the more we can invest in after-school programs, uh, the better off we are. Uh, most of the after-school programs that are currently operating uh, are oversubscribed, meaning too, you know, there are too, too many young people want to sign up and there are not enough slots. Uh, and so to the extent that we can gradually increase those programs and also work with non-for-profit organizations, uh, church groups, uh, you know, synagogues, mosques, other uh, organizations that potentially uh, have the facilities but just need a little bit of money to help subsidize it. As long as they're open to all youth and not just youth that are members of that church, uh, those are institutions that I think we need to build on in terms of uh, improving access. Mr. Obama, I want to get back to something you said in answering your question about how you were able to sort of extricate yourself from drugs and alcohol. Right. You said that you started asking questions about the larger community, but right. what prompted you to start asking questions about the larger community. Was yeah. there somebody who influenced you? Yeah. Was it strictly an internal realization? Uh, what can other young people learn from that? Well, you know, I think there were a couple of things. One, I do think uh, that I had good influences. When I uh, finally got to college, uh, there were certain professors uh, who would ask me questions about... No, but I'm talking about how you, how you managed to get away from drugs and alcohol specifically. Well, that's, and, that, and that's what I'm talking about specifically, yeah. uh, is, is that... Well, uh, here, here's what I would say, is, is that I think most of the time young people who get involved in drugs or alcohol or just don't pay attention to schoolwork, uh, that's a symptom. And the larger cause is they don't know who they are or what they care about, what values are important to them. Uh, and so when teachers asked, started, professors start, that I respected started asking me questions about, um, you know, what are you going to do uh, with your life? Or what responsibility do you take for uh, the situation in the communities that you're living in, or recommending books to me that spoke to um, uh, the struggles that had taken place uh, you know, in the Civil Rights Movement, or the SNCC workers who went down south, or the Freedom Riders who helped to secure uh, voting rights for people. And they started holding up these models of what was possible in your life. Then when you start embracing that, uh, then uh, that all these other distractions start fading away and they faded away naturally uh, because suddenly I was consumed and much more interested in um, how could I have an impact on this larger world and I knew I couldn't have an impact on this larger world just playing basketball all the time because I wasn't tall enough and I uh, you know I didn't have a very good right hand. <laughs> Let's go back to a question from a student uh, Anais. I would like to know uh, currently, your children, do they attend public or private school? And when you made this decision, did you or do you still currently feel that that was the best educational outlet for them? Right. Well, I have very young children. I've got a six-year-old and a three-year-old. Uh, right now, they attend lab school, which is a private school. We, we sent them there primarily because it's five minutes from our house, and I teach at the University of Chicago, uh, as does, uh, and my wife works at the University of Chicago, so we get very deep discounts in terms of uh, the rates. Uh, we. If, should I be fortunate enough to win uh, this uh, election, uh, then we are still trying to figure out, you know, what schooling is going to be appropriate. My preference is going to be to send them to uh, one of the language academies or the, the, uh, the magnet schools that exist within the public school system if they uh, are in Chicago. But we didn't want to make a transition because it was a three-year program, and they had a preschool program that was actually cheaper than had we gone to the public schools. And unfortunately, one of the things you learn um, when you uh, go into public office is you don't make a lot of money. So, you know, some of this was financial in terms of the decisions that we made. 
You know, just following up on that, there was a report this past week that a high percentage of public school teachers are sending their children to private right. schools. What I mean, what message does it send right. when high visibility people, not just teachers, right. when high visibility teachers send their kids to private schools? Well, I think that the, uh, the there is no doubt, and that's part of the reason why I'm interested in, in, in finding the right public school for my daughters. I think it's important for us uh, to show that we have that commitment. Um, now, the truth of the matter is, is that there are a bunch of public schools uh, in the city of Chicago and a lot of urban areas all across the state that aren't working as well as they should. And I think that, you know, every parent wants to make sure that their child is getting uh, the best possible education. Uh, we do have a commitment, though, and have to have a commitment uh, to making sure that all children uh, have those opportunities. And, and that's something that uh, all of us, I think, have to be committed to, teachers, principals, students, and parents. Uh, because, you know, since we've been talking a lot about education, one of the things that I always emphasize is we can get more money for the public schools, uh, but that money is not going to make any difference if, you know, kids don't turn off the television set and they don't put away the PlayStation and we don't get over uh, sort of an attitude that I think exists in many minority communities where if you are succeeding in school, then you're a jerk or a nerd or you're acting white. Um, you know, those kinds of attitudes, I think, uh, contribute uh, to uh, us not having as good of an educational uh, opportunity uh, as we should have. I think we have a question from Iris Martinez. Iris? How would you handle the violence and the game-related crimes and killings of kids my age in my community? Well, the, uh, you know, the, the violence that exists in, in many communities in Chicago uh, have a lot of different sources. But here's a couple things that we know. Uh, easy access to illegal handguns is something that we have to shut down. Uh, and I've uh, repeatedly suggested that we have to have programs, for example, if gun dealers are selling to straw purchasers. And, you know, and what that means is somebody who says, I'm going to buy 15 guns, but it's not really just for them. They put them in the back of a car and then they come into the neighborhood and start distributing them that those people and the dealers have to be held accountable for that, to try to eliminate some of the guns on the streets. We also know, though, that young people don't shoot each other when they're succeeding in school. Uh, and so everything that we've talked about in terms of education has to be something that we focus on. Uh, and uh, the third area that I think makes a difference is programs like Ceasefire, for example, uh, a program that uh, has teams of people, many of them young people, many of them former gangbangers, who are trained to mediate and intervene quickly uh, when there's a conflict. Uh, and they're, they've got, they work closely not only with the police, but also folks on the streets so that when they hear something's going on, they can send a group to try to mediate and, and cool out the situation uh, that exists. Uh, those are all strategies that I think uh, can make a contribution to reducing the violence. Uh, but ultimately, the single most important thing to reducing violence is giving the young people who are engaging in violence, uh, some other opportunities uh, for them to, uh, to excel and succeed. Uh, now, we have a question about what your legislative agenda would be if you're elected. Jamari? If you were to be elected to the Senate, what would be the first legislation you would propose? You know, uh, I think that the first area where we can make a, a, a significant difference is in the area of health care. Uh, because, uh, you know, a lot of young people, y'all don't think you'll ever get sick. Um, that's how I felt when I was young. Uh, but uh, the truth is, is that uh, we have, for example, in Chicago, one of the highest incidents, we have the highest incidence of asthma among young people of any city in the country. Um, there are huge problems with diabetes and other illnesses that are preventable, but because parents uh, or children don't have access to preventative health care, they don't catch it early. So one of the things at the state level that I've done is to expand what's called the uh, Kid Care Program, uh, the Children's Health Insurance Program that provides health insurance for children whose parents don't have health insurance on the job even though they work uh, every day. And part of what I'd like to do is to expand that further. We could actually provide health insurance uh, for every child in America that needs it, uh, including uh, including preventative care. Uh, and we could save money over the long term because a lot of the problems, for example, when somebody gets asthma, uh, and I don't know if anybody here has asthma, but my six-year-old daughter has it. Um, and one time we had to take her to the hospital. Uh, 
And when you go to the hospital, you'll see families who make a weekly trip with their children to the hospital, uh, which is hugely expensive. It's in the emergency room. Instead of giving them the kinds of, uh, of uh, uh, treatments early that would actually save money. So that's, I think, an area that I'd like to focus on right away. Question from Gustavo Laboy. Um, <clears throat> I personally think oh, abortion is wrong. Mm -hmm. Why do you support the women's right to have an abortion? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the, uh, I think abortion is a difficult moral issue. Uh, and I think that different people have different views depending on uh, their faith and their beliefs. Um, what I've consistently said is, is that uh, after viability, after a child is, uh, or after a fetus is um, uh, able to live outside the mother's body, outside the womb, then it's appropriate to be able to restrict those abortions uh, because essentially at that point that fetus can live separate from the mother. And I think we would all agree that uh, we should preserve that life. Before viability, when that fetus can't live outside the mother's womb, um, you or I may have uh, very personal views about um, what that fetus is and whether it should uh, be able to survive or not. But it's not our position to impose on that woman uh, something that has to do with her body. Um, you know, it's her body, essentially, that, that uh, is uh, at stake. And it's up to her conscience in consultation with her doctor and her minister and, you know, in a conversation with uh, her family that has to make those determinations. Uh, and I don't want to be uh, in a situation in which the government is telling women uh, what they do with their own bodies uh, at those stages. Senator, the next question arises out of students' concerns regarding uh, teen pregnancy, about uh, health, about AIDS, and it comes from Jasmine? Jasmine Davis? I attend Curie High School. I'm in a group called Forefront. Mm -hmm. We're currently pushing to get condoms passed out at our school. Do you think condoms should be passed out at schools? Well, the, what I think is is that uh, intelligent sexual education, uh, including teaching abstinence as a strategy, uh, should be uh, an important part of uh, any education for teenagers in this day and age. Because you guys are getting all kinds of information whether we like it or not from music videos and rap songs and just seeing advertisements on the bus uh, up and down the street uh, so uh, people are going to be interested and curious about sex and might as well give them the best information possible uh, particularly uh, in terms of preventing pregnancy and preventing sexually transmitted diseases uh, I think that when you actually start distributing condoms uh, in the schools that can cause some issues because people may start thinking that we're trying to promote uh, sexual activity. Uh, education, I think, allows the student to uh, talk to their parents uh, and potentially access um, uh, you know, contraception as necessary. Uh, and I think it's a complicated issue. I, I commend you uh, for trying to promote good education because uh, if the, the more informed, particularly uh, young men and women are, about uh, the problems related to teen pregnancy, uh, the less likely they are to engage uh, in that kind of activity. Uh, the, the, the big, uh, one of the big, uh, biggest in indicators of uh, a young woman dropping out of school, not going to college, and being locked in poverty is having uh, a baby uh, when she's still in high school. A question about the war from Weida. Weida. Um, do you think the president should continue on with the war or close the whole operation? Why or why not? Well, you know, I was opposed to the war. Uh, I thought it was a bad idea for us to go in. Uh, I didn't think that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction that would cause us an imminent threat. Uh, I think our priority should have been on al-Qaeda and that terrorist network that was responsible for 9-11. Uh, now that we're there, we've got to make it work. Uh, and the reason we have to make it work is because uh, not only uh, would there be a humanitarian crisis if we pulled out. I mean, the Iraqis right now have no government that can uh, provide basic law and order, and so there would be uh, potentially civil war there that would cause uh, you know, 
hundreds of thousands potentially to die, uh, but also because uh, we now have to have some uh, stability in that region. Uh, and uh, without our presence for a while, I think the, the entire area would collapse and become uh, exactly what it wasn't before George Bush went in, which is uh, a haven for terrorists. Now, what I think we can do, though, is phase out over the next uh, four years, five years, uh, the amount of troops that we have in, as long as we're getting the in entire international community to feel invested in the reconstruction uh, of Iraq. So it's not just American soldiers and American taxpayers, but you've got other countries contributing to the reconstruction process, investing money in it. And the most important thing that we have to do in terms of reconstruction is making sure that uh, the Iraqis themselves can train a police force and uh, army troops that can maintain basic law and order and basic security. Uh, until we do that, we're going to continue to have the kinds of problems that we've seen, and Americans are going to continue to, to die uh, unnecessarily. And that is where we're going to have to leave it. The questions will continue as your credits are rolling, but in the meantime, our thanks to Barack Obama. A round of applause for Mr. Obama. Thank you, guys. And our thanks also to the Annenberg Public Policy Center, the Chicago Public Schools, the Mikva Challenge, and to the high school students here in our audience. Give yourselves a round of applause. For WPGW 11 and Chicago Student Voices, I'm Phil Ponce. Thanks for watching. Bye.